Welcome to Wealthy On. I'm your host, Eric Chemi. Today, we are joined by Mark Faber. He's the publisher of the Gloom Boom Doom Report and is well known in market circles, especially for his so called pessimistic stock market commentary. Mark, thank you so much for joining me here at the beginning of the year. I appreciate you coming on the show. Well, thank you very much for having me and for giving me your time. And uh, I wish all your viewers a prosperous and uh, life fulfilling 2024. For for sure, I think we're all we're all trying to get that right. That's the goal for everybody. And, and my first question is: I know you're in Asia, you're in Thailand. It's it's noon here on the East Coast. What time is it over there? Like, I appreciate you making time for me in the middle of the night. Now it's uh, twelve twelve in the morning. <laughs> so it's exactly twelve hours. Yeah. So I'm it's noon midnight. and you're midnight. It's midnight plus twelve minutes. That why well, I appreciate that. If you were not with me right now, would you even be in bed? Because I got the sense that you're kind of a, a night owl. You're a late guy. I never go to sleep before eight or ten o'clock in the morning because I work at night. Okay. Okay. Because a lot of uh, markets trade around the S and P. I mean, it may happen that the market goes up when the S and P closes down, but it's rather exceptional. So when the S&P closes down, it brings about a negative tone to other markets, to the Asian markets, which then open after the close in New York. How do you sleep at eight in the morning, nine in the morning when it's sunny outside? How, how, well, how, how well you can sleep you sleep at, at that night? Time? I don't know how other people sleep. I, I don't know how other <laughs> men sleep. I sleep anytime. I sleep the best. On my chair when I fall asleep working or watching a movie or whatever. <laughs> Do you, is there anything is there anything in the markets right now that I would say keep you up at night, but maybe I'll say that keep you up in the morning or you know prevent you from falling asleep? Is there any stressful events in the markets or geopolitics that that worry you? Well, it doesn't worry me specifically in my daily life, but I'm deeply concerned about the quality of the bureaucrats we have in the Western world, in the US and especially in Europe, the quality of our leadership is a disaster. I mean, if you compare to the great presidents the US had in the 19th century, then we really have had in the last 20 years, a series of uh, completely incompetent characters. How would you rank the incompetence if you look at the last 20 years, if you look, you know, 2000 onward? <laughs> I'm not a school teacher and I'm not in the uh, committee of Harvard and so forth. But common sense is an important feature for someone who has competence and the talent for organizing and for implementing uh, policies that make sense instead of uh, that or policies that are based on some kind of ludicrous ideology. So we have an example as an, uh, in the case of Germany, which was uh, in the 50s and 60s, so-called Wirtschaftswunder, the miracle, economic miracle, and the country did very well until the late 1980s, 1990s. We had, in my opinion, in Germany, in the form of Karl Otto Pöhl, uh, who was the chairman of the Bundesbank, the CEO of the Bundesbank. We had a brilliant, intelligent uh, central banker with common sense and now we have in Europe all these money printers. And it, the worst part is these interventionists uh, that central bankers have become. They, and when you hear their speeches, they want to do this, they want to do that. And it's all nebulous because they are data dependent themselves. And it would appear to me, sadly, that uh, the current Fed chair is also motivated by politics. In other words, uh, his desire is uh, to have 
the Democrats, specifically Biden, re-elected and at all cost to avoid having a Trump winning the elections. You, you understand? It seems to me that the government, uh, the Treasury Department under Janet Yellen, who is not exactly a qualified person to run anything in government, and the Fed is all the same. And the deficits in the US, as you should know, are enormous, over 6% of GDP in what the administration calls an economic expansion. I'm not so sure the economy is expanding, but that's what the administration says. And we have these deficits. You take the deficit away, and there's no economic growth. And the deficit, and these idiots, for years and years, they told us that uh, through the monetary, uh, modern moder monetary theory, MMT, that deficits wouldn't matter. And now they have it in front of their eyes that it matters because the interest payments on the debts are going ballistic up strongly. So those facts, I think we can we can all agree on, right? I think that's a that's anyone who doesn't know that is is missing something important. So my question is, knowing that, how are you personally invested? Where do you actually put your Mark Faber money? Well, the guiding principle is not to trust any politician or any central bankers. They're all liars. They mislead the public throughout the period that they've been in uh, in office. And uh, my sense is the only way to really protect yourself is by owning precious metals. I'm not saying it's the best investment, but it's kind of a safe uh, way to protect yourself from, and I have to emphasize this, the evilness of central bankers, because the central bankers are basically bankrupting uh, the middle class and the lower classes and uh, are of benefit to pigs like myself that have assets. You understand? We have precise statistics how much of the wealth in America is owned by the richest people and how much is owned by the 50 poorest people. I mean, the, the, there shouldn't be any poor people in America. It should be reasonably well distributed. But it's happened because of monetary policies, because the asset holders benefit from asset inflation, including so me. I'm saying this as an economist and a social observer, not as someone who is a, an investor, but as an investor, I don't care how much they print because something goes up and something goes down. And it is our duty as fund managers and investors to find the sectors that will go up and the sectors that will go down. So I guess that's that's my question is a lot of people watching, a lot of people listening, they're going to agree with you that they're concerned about Fed policy, about central bankers, about inflation, about printing money, about the value of MMT. And so that's why I was getting to like, Knowing all that, though, what do they do about it? Do they stay invested in the market? Are you invested in the stock market? Are they just, do you just own a bunch of gold and silver and you keep it at your house? And like, what do they actually do? If they 100% agree yeah. with you, what, what should they actually transact in then? Because I assume you don't, you don't just have gold and silver. I assume you've got money in equity markets. Maybe you even have some fixed income. Yes, but uh, I mean, it's a good idea to hold some gold in your garden somewhere but don't tell your relatives about it because you may get killed relatively soon or poisoned or whatever. And uh, the other point I want to make is, you understand your question would have been easy to answer in the 1950s. Right. My grandparents always told me, Mark, you have to work and 10% of your salary you put aside and you save and you put it in a cantonal bank. These are kind of state institutions in Switzerland. They're owned largely by the cantons, by the states, and it's very safe. And But this has changed. You understand, money in the bank in an inflationary environment 
uh, never pays the sufficient interest. It's always sort of below the true cost of living increases. Now, the problem with gold, uh, there are many problems. I don't want to go uh, into all the problems. But one of them is obviously where do you keep your gold? Because if the governments had the great wisdom, because they're all uh, dictatorial, although they pretend to be elected by the voters, they behaved like the worst dictators and locked people up and uh, went to the population and said, if you work for the government or so and so, you have to be vaccinated. You understand? They can force the most evil measures on the people because people don't resist anymore. This is the problem of the current environment in the world is that the people who, are, who can think uh, don't resist sufficiently and they don't go and vote sufficiently to vote the socialist and green communists out of government. What is the perspective like being in Thailand not living in the states anymore, you know, you're seeing this from afar, right? The news flow is different, right? You're not you're not in New York City, you're not in Washington D.C. every day. What is your perspective being, you know, an outsider, being you twelve time zones away? You're as far away as possible from the United <laughs> States, and maybe that's on purpose. <laughs> no, it's not by purpose. But let me tell you the following: people sometimes ask me, "Well, how can you live in a?" in a country with it, which is run by the army or a king and so forth. Uh, I want to say that I'm Swiss and in Switzerland, I feel that I have far less uh, freedom than when I'm in Thailand. As long as you don't uh, viciously attack the government and you don't make any nasty remarks about the king, your individual freedom in Thailand is very high, very high. And uh, what? what kind of freedom though? Freedom to speak, freedom to act. What kind of freedom do you have there that you wouldn't have in America? I can go anywhere and buy a can of beer or a bottle of beer. I don't need to have a shop with a license to sell me beer or something like this. Do you understand? That is freedom. In America, when I go to a hotel and I want to go buy a beer outside the hotel, because the hotel bars are, uh, mini bars are so expensive, or if I want to go and buy a bottle of whiskey, I have to travel for ages to find a liquor store. This is what destroys the economy. Regulation by the government. And I mean, I don't have a very high opinion of Trump. Uh, actually, I have a rather low opinion of him, academically speaking and intelligent-wise. But by doing nothing for four years and eliminating a lot of uh, deadwood regulations, the economy under him and the mood under him was much better than it is at the present time under Mr. Biden. I, I think a lot of people think that way. I think you're going to see you know, maybe he's going to win as a result, right? We we, we can yeah, get into maybe, that, right? That's a whole that, other perspective that we've got for the next, uh, next yes, 10 months. To know who is, we need to know who is counting the votes. As Stalin, who was a very intelligent man, correctly observed, it doesn't matter who votes. What matters is who counts the votes. Right, right. The... The other, the other question I want to get into with you is knowing these facts, right? We know the debt is massive. We know the deficit is getting bigger. We know we know that they're paying so much on interest rates, and we know that there's a lot of political coordination between the Fed and the U.S. government, right? We know all of those things, right? So, yes, where, where when do we see that ticking time bomb, right? Because we could have said the same things 20 years ago, right? Or let's say 15 years ago, post 07 or 08, and here we are 15 years later, ago. And we've gotten richer. I was a very good friend with Stan Salvixen. And uh, he, he was called Aaron Steen and uh, Charlie Minter. They were the three leading strategists at Merrill Lynch in the 80s. And already in 85, 86, they started to talk about the excessive debt growth. 
And if one thing has surprised me in the world, that I have to admit openly, when I studied and also earlier in my career, when I started to work in 1970 on Wall Street, and interest rates were in 1970 at 6% on the 10 years treasury, and then they went to over 15% in 81. I never would have anticipated to see in my life negative interest rates. I had read at university the works of Silvio Gesell, who at the beginning of the 20th century had written books about uh, how to drive consumption. In other words, you introduce negative interest rates in the banks so people will not save money and then they go and spend it. You, you understand? This was kind of a economic sophism because the economy needs savings in order to carry out the capital investments. But anyway, <coughs> I never thought I would see it because interest rates at the end of the uh, 1970s were at uh, 14, 15 uh, percent interest and the interest rates on, gov on uh, deposits was 22 percent bank deposits. So nobody expected interest rates to go up as much as they did. And then nobody expected them to go as low as they did eventually in 2010, 2020. But the one thing that I want to say about uh, your questions about investments, knowing that we all know that, I think uh, people have to analyze everything more in nominal terms, but then adjust it for inflation. Now, you and I, we could have a discussion for three hours about what is inflation. I'd like to say inflation is principally a, a monetary increase in the system. In other words, the quantity of money goes up. And uh, the level of interest rates will never tell you whether money is tight or not tight. That I want to stress. Because in Turkey, we have 100% interest rates and we have inflation at around 100%. And you go into Istanbul and life goes on like normal. So even at 100%, you can have easy monetary policies, which happens during high inflationary period. The criteria is tight in a tight monetary environment the currency strengthens strongly and uh, there is very little speculation. In other words, you don't get, uh, I'll give you an example. The Russell 2000 made in October, November a new low and within 48 days it made a new high. Never happened before. This is the kind of things that happen when money is that there's plenty of liquidity in the system that many people overlooked. That's why I'm telling you, I would not be a heavy short seller of stocks. I might be a short seller of the dollar, but even that I wouldn't do because I don't know what the central bankers will agree with each other because they coordinate their policies. So despite all these concerns, you would still stay long stocks or you certainly wouldn't be short stocks because these things can whip around. And you say fundamentally it's because you think interest rates are not high enough. They're still too easy at the moment. Is that right? Am I understanding that yes. right? Yes, yeah, correct. But they may come down somewhat in the next few months and I would have to explain why exactly. But uh, in general, I think that we began and... Uh, inflationary up cycle and as uh, a former central banker in america said uh, the fed chair he said uh, it's easy to squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube to bring it back into the tube is next to impossible that i agree and this is with inflation you know 
uh, everybody says it's over and so forth. I don't believe it's over, not at all. Because, you don't believe uh, what's over? Inflation. If you were Jerome Powell right now, if you were in charge, what would you be doing then? Would you be even thinking about cutting? Would you be jacking right rates away, higher? Resign. What would you do? Right away, you resign from the mistakes I made. Okay. Okay. So let's say, let me, let me rephrase the question. Let's say the real Jerome Powell resigns and they put you in charge and now you're starting on day one. What would you do tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow they will kick me out. <laughs> Probably. Let's say, let's say you can survive though, right? Let, like, what would you do though if you were in charge? Let's, let's... You're an optimist. You're an optimist. They would kick me out with a, a huge kick. They wouldn't even let you in the building. It's security, yes. security blocking you from the building. Take yeah. my keys away. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but I tell you what I think. The I mean, in a, I know that nobody will vote for my view, but my view is in the Western world, the governments need to cut government expenditures by 50%, five zero. They have to cut social security. They have to cut defense spending. All these American bases all over the world are useless in my opinion. And the other thing I want to say, the, we had price increases over the last three years. Now we may debate for a family with children and a family without children, a family that owns their home outright and the family that pays mortgages, uh, variable mortgages, or rents a uh, property. Everybody has a different rate right. of inflation. Right. My rate of inflation in the last three years was relatively low because the price of beer has stayed steady, didn't go up. That's, that's your and number one expense, huh? <laughs> no, cigarettes is the number one. <laughs> Cigarettes and beer. You sound yeah. like a you sound like a, a nineteen year old teenager, right? It's cigarettes and beer. No, I'm a worker and a union worker. Anyway, uh, but uh, the point is simply: let's say uh, over the last two three years, the cost of living for most households has gone up between fifteen and twenty five. And maybe 30 percent true correct like, yeah roughly now this year 2024 the rate of price increases is only say one or two percent because the rate of inflation is coming down let's assume it's one percent then the central banks will say oh you see we brought down inflation and they will then do what will they do They'll print again money, quantitative uh, easing number. I all, in 2009, when they started, I said, it's going to be infinity. They will never stop printing money. And everybody One thought you were crazy for saying that. Difficult things in your life is to stop smoking, stop taking drugs, and to stop printing money for central banks. Because the system is adjusted to it. We have debts. There's only one option for the U.S. government, default or print money. And in all societies, all societies, whether the Babylonians or the Romans or the Greeks, they have eventually printed money because that's the easiest to do. This is the least painful. So let's let's try to put you back to, let's say somehow, miraculously, you're in charge of the Fed. Would you be, would you be raising rates? Let's say we know, we know you're right. Government needs to cut spending. We know they're not going to do it, right? So let's say you go to Congress and say, I need you to cut 50%. And they say, no, we're going to increase spending. Now it's back to you at the Fed. Would you be raising rates to 6 to 7 to 8%? What can you do? Or is the Fed fundamentally powerless in a no, world? No, you can do it. You can, I would increase it to 20%. 20%. Yes. Then the Congress may wake up. Congress may wake up because Congress is as useless as the Roman Senate under the emperors, they had no power anymore. I think Congress has power. And they have the power to spend. They have the power to put laws and rules into place. They have, they have the power to take away those freedoms that you talk about in Thailand. I think they're not powerless. Uh, they're not powerless, but it's a uniparty. 
Lenin described that very well, that Congress doesn't represent the interest of the ordinary American people. It represents its own interest predominantly. Every CEO has to announce what stocks he's buying and what stocks he's selling and whether he's uh, trading his own stock. Every Wall Street executive, I also took all the courses on Wall Street when I became a registered representative, a principal of a company and the branch manager and option exams, one exam after the other. So I know the rules. But the congressman, they can trade in stocks on inside information. Yep. No, it's, it's, it's really bad. And I know people it's, in... It's not bad. It's unfair to society. And it shows precisely the arrogance and uh, complete disregard of public interest by politicians. Even honest people, they are one day in political office, they become liars. Yeah, you know, it is funny to watch who, who chooses to go into, into politics. So the thing is, though, as we know, like you could have said back in 07, 08, 09, this is going to be infinite, the money printing, right? Yes. And people who were concerned about it, they still were better off keeping their money in the stock market, right? They made good returns keeping their money in equities. If they had gone to cash, they would have done much worse. So is the answer then, you Correct. still have to stay invested in stocks regardless yes. of all of this. Yes, but that's what I'm trying to explain. In a printing money printing environment, it's very dangerous to short stocks. Because I think uh, that the Magnificent Seven are grossly overvalued and so forth. But I would have said the same in 2000 and between Christmas 1999 and March 2000, uh, 2000, the Nasdaq went up another 30%. Right, right, like three months. I covered my shorts in 99, but I had huge losses. How often do you try to short still? Do you even try to short sectors, indices, no more. countries, or no you do more. only do single names? I don't do it. I rather go into cash. But what I wanted to say before, you see, in the 50s, you could put your money in a bank and say it's safe. Mm -hmm. That you cannot do anymore nowadays. Money on deposit in a bank is not safe. That is, should be clear to anyone. Otherwise, not today, I could get 5% interest on my deposits or even more than 5%. But I am reluctant to put all my money on deposit at 5%. Is enough for my lifestyle, although I still work and I earn my money from my business, not from my investments. The investments is a side, is, uh, but I don't think that the investments have gone up much more than the cost of living increases. And especially, say, I look at home prices. Home prices have gone up much more than, say, cash deposits. And the Fed, Yellen was the president of the San Francisco Fed when the bubble burst in 2007. The San Francisco Fed is responsible for California, Nevada, Arizona, the three greatest bubbles in America in housing in 2007 were in these districts. And Yellen couldn't see it, couldn't see it. It's hard to believe that in politics nowadays, incompetence gets rewarded. They're shot up towards the, also in Europe. You look at Ursula von der Leyen, she's the head of the EU, or at Lagarde. All incompetent people, but the more incompetent you are, the higher you go in politics. I don't feel like you would get too far in politics. Look, I'm in the committee of an initiative in Switzerland for neutrality. The best Switzerland can do is to stay neutral. It's good for the world. They can have all kinds of negotiations between evil people and less evil people. Good people don't exist in politics, but less evil maybe. But anyway, uh, I had as a result of that a little to do with politicians. Never in my life life would I go, like to go into politics 
Besides the fact that I'm too old, I mean, I, I don't want to waste my time with these idiots. And the same I can say, never, never in my life would I go and work in a university. Never. The, the, you, know, you mentioned the housing, and it reminds me, at least from my perspective, and I've heard this from many other people, if you look at the three biggest areas where we see massive inflation, it's healthcare, it's housing, and it's college education. And yes. those are the three things that the U.S. government subsidizes. So the things yes. that they're trying to help us by subsidizing, those are the things that the prices run rampant. And, and you sort of wonder if they had stopped subsidizing it, maybe the prices would come down because those, those companies, those businesses would have to actually have a market appropriate price and not that we just keep giving you loans to maximize whatever price they want to charge you. The government officials are mostly left-leaning characters. And also the wealthy people like the socialists. And I tell you why. The easiest in life is to bribe a socialist. Because he's so incompetent that you can even bribe him with little money. Have you seen that from direct experience? I don't bribe people because I don't run a big business and so forth. And I, I was subjected to the temptation of bribes. But I didn't do it because I never needed it in my life. My uh, desires for wealth are inferior to my morals. Do you sometimes wonder, I like that. I like that phrase, your desire for wealth are, are less than your morals, right? The, how, how do I, how do I? And I'm work? not a high morality person. <laughs> <laughs> I frequent nice like, clubs. <laughs> like lesser degrees of evil. It's like they're all still at the bottom somewhere. Do you sometimes not, think when you see the I'm world the around you, when you see this world around you moving in this direction, like when you see where we were 15 years ago or 30 years ago or 50 years ago, and you see now, do you ever think maybe I'm crazy, right? Like maybe Mark Faber is getting it wrong because everyone around me seems to be crazy. So they either all they're crazy or I'm crazy. Does it ever sometimes make you so frustrated and disappointed that, that the rest of the world is not seeing it the way that you're seeing it. I live a life most of the time in solitude. You understand? I stay in the north of Thailand in my house and uh, across the little road of my living house is my office building. So I'm close to the living house, but I can also stay in the office, which I do at the present time because my house is being redecorated at the present time <coughs> because it's an old Thai house. But the office, I am alone the whole night and uh, you are, say, someone I talk to now. And when I finish this interview, I have to go to a birthday of a friend of mine who is in an unfortunate situation because he drank a bit too much and had diabetes then he had to cut all his toes off and so forth but he owns a bar <laughs> he's a he's a he's a, a, he's a positive uh character <laughs> you're going tonight at one in the morning yes. yeah yes i go now at one and then i come home around four or three whatever and uh i'm not disappointed not at all I sort of uh, think that it's normal when you give the vote to everyone. I don't think that uh, the founding fathers of the US and the Greeks, they had democracies and also other countries had democracies, but it was never a question that everyone could vote. That should be understood. And uh, I'm not sure that democracies uh, are the ideal system. Now, some people say they're, all the systems are bad, but democracy is better. The problem, the way democracies are structured today, is that people do not get punished for very bad decisions and evil decisions. You understand? As I said, you get promoted. If I run a business and I make a mistake, I lose a ton of money. And uh, in the worst case, I have to close down my business. Uh, this is the point I want to make is, a personal responsibility doesn't exist by in government circles. And uh, I have a very low opinion of politicians. Very, I mean, extremely low.
I see that. And, and I think anyone who goes to your website will see that too. Anyone who reads your report will see that too. I move around the lowest circles of society, nightlife, in the worst bars you can imagine. But I feel more comfortable among these people than among politicians. The ranking, when you look at different countries, right? If you're, obviously there's opportunities now to invest across the globe, no matter where you are. Yes. Would you invest in, in U.S. stocks? Here we are in January, you know, first, first week here, stocks have started to decline. Would you be investing? Would you be going along in the U.S.? Would it be Europe? A lot of people I've talked to say Europe's got even more problems than the U.S. Would it be parts of Asia? Correct. If someone's got money, let's say they've got some money, right? They got to put it somewhere. They got to put it to work. You can't put it in the bank. Like you said, that's going to get you nowhere. You can't, you can't buy all gold and stick it in, in your in your garden. So you got to put it in equity somewhere. How yes. would you rank the countries and what factors are you looking at for that ranking? I don't want to give advice. I can only tell you what I do with my yeah. money. Okay? I want to hear what you do. That That's the most interesting to me is what does Mark Favre do with his money? So I have, uh, starting with Europe, I have a portfolio in Switzerland. I'm Swiss. I have a Swiss passport. And uh, I own some properties in Switzerland. And I'm essentially a patriotic Swiss. I'm uh, in Switzerland. We have left-wing uh, political parties, the Socialist Party (SP), and then we have SVP. They call it a, a right-wing party. I would rate myself as being far right from the right-wing party in Switzerland. I mean miles away from the <laughs> right-wing party in Switzerland and in Germany. But I have investments in Switzerland and uh, also in other European countries, in France and uh, in... Um, I keep some of gold in Switzerland in safe deposit boxes. And then I have a portfolio of resources um, in Canada, which include some gold shares. But the gold share component in my portfolio is very small compared to the physical gold and silver and platinum that I hold. Because I don't hold gold because I want to become rich, but because I consider it to be relatively, not 100%, but relatively safe. Okay, so this is uh, the European and the resource part. And then I uh, also own Asian stocks. I have a portfolio of uh, Asian property stocks. Uh, and I've increased this in the last two, three months significantly because I think that an unusual opportunity has arisen in Hong Kong. Hong Kong property stocks, uh, most of them are not le highly leveraged. There's one or two companies that have leverage, but the other ones have very low leverage. And some have no leverage, no debts, zero debts. In other words, the families own everything. And uh, these companies sell at between, say, a 60 to 75% discount to asset value. So the asset value of the share market, uh, the, of, the, of the marketplace, is significantly higher than the share price would indicate. So if I can buy an asset at a 60%, 70% discount to asset value, I think the risk is still existent, but in absence of a huge debt load, it's not that great. And I'm the first one to think that Hong Kong property prices will still go down. But I wrote a very negative book about city, uh, Hong Kong in 1997 when the handover took place. It was a, a history of the rise and the fall of cities. And uh, it's always the case when an empire takes over a city, whether it was Augsburg or Venice, or Tangier, uh, the city's importance diminishes. That is clear. But Venice has survived relatively well until today, you know, and, and Hong Kong 
the character is changing from a very international mm-hmm. city, it will become a very important city within China and specifically within the greater Bay Area, that the GBA, around Hong Kong, including Guangdong province and Guangzhou. These are 80 million people. So if I am an important city in a country with 80 million people, I think I can do quite well. And Hong Kong still has unusual freedom for people. And uh, the infrastructure, I'd like to hear from any of your viewers in America, where is it guaranteed that in rush hours, you're in 30 minutes from the center of the city at the airport. Show me that in America. I've been many times in to Kennedy, two hours sometimes, and in horrible taxis. <laughs> yeah, the, the Kennedy, the getting from Kennedy to New York City to actually get to Manhattan is often longer than the than the flight itself in many circumstances, yeah, right? Of so course. yeah. Of course. That's your investments then. So it's real estate. Gold physically and and in shares, and resources shares. in Canada. You know, I have a lot of all kinds of shares because in Asia we have essentially two. Im- well, I mean two important conglomerates: the Swire Group and Jardines. Jardines, the head office or legal office is now in Singapore, and their stocks are quoted in Singapore. And among their companies are Hong Kong Land. Dairy Farm and Jardine uh, Cycle and Carriages and uh, uh, Jardine Madison. All these companies sell at a huge discount to asset value. Also, Swire. The Swire Group is a very high quality group because it's run by a very, say, conservative family. Extremely low key and conservative, nice people. What's your advice for people who, let's say they're stuck here, they can't go to Thailand, they can't move to Thailand, right? They, they have their regular job, they're working class, they want to save, they've got kids, and they're hearing you and they think, I don't know if I'm ever going to make it. I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to provide for my family. I don't know if my kids are ever going to grow up in a country where they have the same opportunities that they did or that you did You know, at, at that age, a previous generation. What's your advice for them? What are they supposed to do? Well, I think that, uh, you know, I see this in Jewish families mostly, uh, that they, the parents are very kind of concerned about the good education and that they have the right teachers and so forth. And uh, when I see Randy Weingarten, Weingartner, she's the president of the union of the teachers, then it, I feel sick. You know, to have someone like this representing the teachers' union is a disaster. I mean, it's a horrible thing. Uh, I think I would give uh, or put more time into the education of my children. Yeah, it's probably the best and thing. To number do. two, I think that the U.S., I mean, uh, although I have a strong criticism of its government, the typical American is a nice guy and is a decent person. What came in through the migration is another story. Uh, you understand in terms of culture and uh, of uh, religion frequently and of um, the morals. The typical American is a hardworking guy. You know, this, this was always our impression that the American, that they actually do work more than we Europeans. But nothing exceeds the evilness of the American State Department. That I need to point out. They are run by neocons who want war. And everywhere they interfere, when a foreign country interferes in America, it's a huge violation. But the Americans interfered everywhere. I've seen it with my own eyes. And I know it because I was the trustee of the children of one of the democracy leaders during the demonstrations in Hong Kong in 2018, 2019. 
These demonstrations were instigated, organized and paid for by NGOs from the US. They wanted to discredit China. And the laws, the security laws have tightened in Hong Kong because of this intervention by the Americans. I feel like that would be a whole separate podcast. <laughs> that would be that'll be a whole other topic that that we could spend a lot of time on. Um, yes. But I know this very well. I mean, I, the leader of the democratic movement uh, of the, this demonstration is sitting in jail. His family uh, can't even visit him. He was a very good friend of mine. I've known him for 40 years, for 40 or 50 years, because his wife is the best friend of my wife. <laughs> yeah, no, no I, I believe you. I, I think that was a very uh, a treacherous time there. But the other point, I mean, you know, about markets, I just want to say, I think Latin America still looks reasonably attractive. It's gone up a lot last year. I mean, Brazil has outperformed the US as well as Mexico and Argentina performed very well. But I think that Colombia has a, a potential at the present time. And I have money in Latin America because if it comes to World War Three which some Americans want, not the American individual, the American individual. He hates war, but the politicians like it and the defense industry loves it. And the weapon dealers and ask where are the weapon dealers coming from? They love it as well. You yeah, know, it's it's never them who actually have to fight the war, right? It's the regular working class people that actually have to put their, their bodies on the line. Yes, to be fair, the Roman emperors were mostly useless. But some of them were in the front line of battles. Napoleon was initially also in the front lines. Patton was in the front lines. I don't see whoever wins the election. I don't see whoever wins the election this year. I don't see any of them going to the front lines if we have a war. I don't see that happening. I see them running down into the bunker. Yeah. They're all cowards. Mark, I, I appreciate the time. I really appreciate you walking through your investments and how you're thinking about stuff and even saying... You may be bearish, but it's too dangerous to short with such accommodative policy. It allows for so much speculation. I think that's really important for our, our viewers to understand that and to hear that from you. Actually, the worse the economy becomes, the more likely that money is being printed. And I've seen many countries with my own eyes that were in high inflation, where all the Latin American countries in the 80s and 70s, and also in China and also in Russia, uh, what happens is that the worse the economy becomes, the more they print money. And so the stock market in nominal terms can go up like this, okay? But the currency then goes down like this. And as a result of that high inflation, countries can get a very low level of price stocks of stock prices, like Argentina a year ago. And in, 85, in 86, the Argentine stock market had a market cap of $600 million. The whole country, $600 million. In the 1920s, Argentina was the third or fifth richest country in the world. No longer, no, and, and not even close. And it shows you that with bad decisions, you can really have bad outcomes, right? Progress is not guaranteed. In the case of Argentina, for example, you could be one of the richest countries in the world, and now you're just simply not even close to that because there were bad decisions made. Correct. And uh, But that it wasn't just bad decisions. It was bad decisions by the interventionist socialists, the populist, Peron, and so forth, spending money, spending money without... This worries me the most about the U.S., the complete disregard of saving money. The government, uh, they don't care. They send a billion here, a bill no, not a billion, 100 billion here, 100 trillion, trillion there. Now it's a trillion here, a trillion there. Yes. I mean, I tell you, in 1970, if someone walked into your office or you got a client and he opened an account with you for say half a million or a million, it was a huge account for an individual. The typical account, the average account at Merrill Lynch was about 3,000 US dollars. Like nothing, yeah. 
And now people say, oh, there hasn't been much inflation. Bullshit. There's been huge inflation in asset prices. And I feel sorry for young people. There's no way they can live my lifestyle when they are 25 years old. I rented an apartment in Zurich, best location behind the theater, the Bellevue Platz. It is the best location you can have in Zurich. And I spent about 5% of my income on the rent. Show me anyone in New York. No way. It's Chicago, like 50, 50 San Francisco. Bye-bye. It's, it's 50%. Are you living with your parents? Yeah. yeah. Yes. This is the point. That, that's But what I was getting at earlier about the, the next the government generation. Lies right? to the public. They say everything is wonderful. Do you have any investments in the United States? Uh, I have occasionally treasury bonds. That's it. I think that, you see, I don't know how the world will look like in five years' time. I'm not as uh, terribly bullish about treasury bonds, but there is a chance uh, that we are already in a what I would call a silent depression. It, it, it's not obvious, but the standards of living are going down. That, that, that is clear. That is statistically shown by the Fed, actually and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The standards of living are going down and we may slip into a depression. Uh, and it is possible that it could be a deflationary recession. So I'm not ruling out that treasury bond deals before they go to 20% yield, that they drop, say if the high was around 5% on the 10 years, they could drop to say 3%. And then they go up to 8% and then drop to 4%, then they go up to 20%. But it doesn't happen overnight. Interest, inflation cycles and lo interest cycles are long-term cycles. They last 50, 60 years from peak to peak and trough to trough. There's a lot, a lot to think about. I, I feel like my mind is going to be buzzing now the rest of the day, thinking about everything you said, thinking about how to process it. And, and you you're trying to figure out how to invest to a bar. <laughs> Let's go to a bar. <laughs> yeah. I know you got that birthday party to go to. You got to hit the bar. Um, yes. I, I appreciate the time, Mark. This is super fascinating. I appreciate you walking through just how you're investing, how you're thinking about it, and, and how you see different parts of the globe right now. I mean, in general, as an observation, I think wealthy families in the Western world do not have enough money in the emerging world. How much do you think they should you have? They have percentage? money, say, in New Zealand and in Australia and in uh, the UK and in Europe and in the US and maybe Canada, Australia, but they don't have enough money in India, China, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Russia, and so forth. This is a mistake. What percentage should they have? Like 15%, something like that, just to have some exposure to those areas? 5%, I 10%? Mean, in, equities, in equities, I have uh, 70% of uh, my, age, my investments are in emerging economies. What do you think an American, like you said, a wealthy American family, how much you, should they be putting in emerging markets if they live in the U.S.? Well, it depends which family. <laughs> 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 Whichever one you were thinking maybe, of in your head. Maybe there are some families, they should put everything away. <laughs> But I would say 88% of the global population lives outside NATO and EU and the US. You understand? Mm -hmm. It's a different world. And if 88% of the population lives there, I would consider having at least 50% of my money in these countries. Makes sense. Makes sense. Mark, so good. Thank you so much. We we went longer than we thought we were going to go. We could, we could keep going, but I know you've got, you've got a busy night ahead of you tonight. <laughs> and to you and all your viewers, I wish all the best in 2024. I think it's going to be a very volatile year. Thanks again to my guest, Mark Faber, for joining me here on Wealthy On. Of course, if you liked the episode, Or if you hated the episode, you know, feel free to comment, forward it, share it, engage with it. That's how more people can be part of the debate, right? He said some things that you might not like, you might disagree with, but that's why we want to present different opinions here so you can get a sense for what some people are thinking about and that can help you figure out 
how you can invest as well. You want to hear all sides of the story here, especially in the markets. And if you're thinking about someone to maybe help you with these investments, you can go to Wealthion.com. There's a short form there. We've got investment professionals that we endorse, that we vetted, that we work with, that you can connect with. It's free. There's no commitment. There's no obligation. You can just have a conversation, see if they're right for you. Again, that's a short form on Wealthion.com. And you can also put in your questions for Anthony Scaramucci's show. He's got a live show every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern. So you can watch the show live or you can put your questions in on Wealthion.com or you can do both. Thanks again for watching and listening. I'm Eric Chummy. We'll see you next time.